Okay, hello everyone. Welcome to the College of Continuing and Professional Studies webinar, Think and Act Strategically. Thank you so much for joining us. My name is Megan Fleming and I will be your moderator for today's webinar. If you have future questions about this webinar or other programs that we offer, please contact our information center and that contact information will be on the last slide of this presentation. There are some logistical items that I'd like to address before we begin. I ask that you please submit your questions throughout the webinar so that we can address them during the Q&A portion in the last five minutes of this presentation. To submit your questions, select the Q&A button in the top right-hand corner, type your question, and then press send. You can see the Q&A button in the top right corner and the send button is located at the bottom. After the webinar, we will send an email in the next few days, which will have a link to the recording. The link will be sent to the email address that you submitted during registration. Whether or not you have a role in creating strategy for your organization, if you're in a management or supervisory position, you have a role to play in strategy execution. Organizations need people who think and act strategically. Executive teams cannot implement strategy on their own. Those who understand an organization's goals and who can align their efforts in support of those goals not only add value to the organization, but find their efforts can enhance their career. The ability to execute separates successful organizations from their competitors and gives a career advantage to those able to think and act strategically. In this webinar, we'll explore how strategic plans are created and the mechanisms for strategy execution that lead to the accomplishment of goals. After this webinar, you'll know how strategic plans are created, mechanisms for strategy execution, and which measures drive performance. Please join me in welcoming Dick DeBleek. He is one of our adjunct instructors and teaches courses like strategic planning, leadership, and project management. Thanks, Dick. Right, thanks, Megan, and welcome everyone uh, participating. The outcomes you see listed here are pretty much what Megan uh, described. We'll talk about how strategic plans are created, specific mechanisms for strategy execution. We'll talk about measurement, specifically measures that drive performance and goal accomplishment. And then throughout, I want to talk about everyone's role in creating success. As Megan said in her introduction, everyone has a role. There might be a handful of senior uh, leaders involved in creating strategy, but everyone has a role uh, in creating success for uh, the organization. So a little background uh, on my career, and you'll see how this ties into today's presentation. Early in my career, I worked for a McGraw-Hill subsidiary called EMS, where we did, among other things, planning uh, efforts for client organizations. So I started out managing projects of different types, uh, eventually evolved into managing the finance and human resources part of the business. And that's why I went back to the U of M to get my MBA because I'd pretty much been Peter principled into a role that was beyond my capability at that time. But fortunately, I found some level of success. I went on to work with a company called Management Systems where, again, we did strategic planning for client organizations. And then I started my business. Uh, some time ago, and you see the three bullet points there, kind of the tagline I use to describe my business is I help clients manage people, plans, and projects. And you'll see how all those things tie together as we go through the presentation today. Um, I'd like to start out just by getting everyone thinking a little bit at the very highest level. And you don't have to answer this, this is more rhetorical, but you know, do you know your organization's mission and vision? Even if you can't recite word for word, do you have some sense about what your organization uh, exists to do or to accomplish? And then more concretely, do you know what your organization's current strategic uh, goals are? And then how about as those get translated down, what's your level of familiarity with supporting goals and objectives, specifically those that connect to you, uh, your team, your department, your function, et cetera. Ideally, we'd like everyone in an organization to understand how the work they're doing uh, connects to or supports strategy. And uh, so we'll revisit that question in just a little bit, and that's going to get to some of our discussion about uh, you know, executing strategy. Does everyone in the organization 
have an understanding about where they fit into the bigger scheme of things. Uh, this next set of questions is not necessarily rhetorical. We'd actually like to chat in, have you chat in, um, and you can chat to Megan if you would care to answer this question. What is your role? I'm interested in who is participating today and what your role is. For example, are you involved at a more senior level in creating strategies and goals? Would you say your role is involved with executing strategy? Are you involved in leading you know, what many organizations would call strategic initiatives? Are you leading projects and do you see a tie to strategy or do you have a role in day-to-day -day operations and do you see how strategy uh, affects what you're doing in day-to-day -day operations or any other role, maybe just interested uh, participant, but if you could chat in a little bit with how you see your uh, role tying into today's presentation and maybe what generated your interest in today's presentation, that will just help me to understand a little bit better uh, who our participants are today. And then moving on, here's a quote I picked up from a Harvard Business Review article uh, some time back that talks about the importance of strategic uh, thinking. And of course, it says senior executives believe strategic thinking uh, is a critical skill for an organization's success. I say uh, strategic thinking and acting is an important uh, skill for anyone who seeks to advance their career or contribute to organizational uh, performance and goal accomplishment. And the more any individual uh, can think and act strategically, the more value you add to the organization and the more uh, career enhancing that is. So you're going to see that theme winding through this presentation where we talk about how everybody uh, has a role in creating success for your organization. A quick overview of the strategic planning process. Uh, three fundamental phases or stages situational analysis, strategy and goal formulation, and then implementation slash execution. And the three simple questions we're addressing you see in parentheses. The first one, where are we? What's our beginning point? The second question, where do we want to be? That's more of the fun question, the uh, hoping, wishing, dreaming, uh, etc. And then the really hard question, the third one, how do we get to where we intend to be? Who's got to do what uh, to help us to reach goals, uh, implement and execute strategies, uh, at, and do mission advancing sort of work? And then you see the bullet points down below that begin a little bit of a preview of one of the uh, prime mechanisms I've uh, evolved to using for strategy execution, and it centers around project selection and the impact of strategy on day-to-day uh, -day operations and then putting in place all the actions and controls that are needed. Who needs to do what and when? How are we gonna know how we're performing? That's where measurement comes in. So we'll talk about those pieces as we go as well. So the three basic questions, where are we? Where do we wanna be? And how do we get there? We'll run through those uh, in succession. And then just to emphasize that planning is not you know, a, a one-time or once-a-year uh, type event. It really is an ongoing effort. It's a way that organizations should manage uh, their work. Um, and so you see this kind of iterative diagram that says, yes, we might, during the planning process, go through these things sequentially, first situational analysis, then strategy and goal formulation, followed by uh, execution. But then you see the arrow going back to situational analysis as things change. You know, as the industry changes, as the economy changes, as the world changes, as demographics shift or whatever else, we have to revisit, uh, you know, the current uh, situation, maybe update or reformulate strategies and goals. Maybe we have to uh, change how we're uh, executing uh, strategies. So it's an ongoing and dynamic sort of process, not a single uh, event. And then coming back to those uh, questions, uh, the first one being, you know, where are we? Um, I'm going to use this analogy, and uh, you see a map here of the Boundary Waters, the northern part of Minnesota and the adjoining area in Coetico on the Canadian side of the border. If I parachuted you in uh, to a lake there and you find yourself on the shore of one of these lakes with a map and compass in hand, and I said, all right, here's what I want you to do. I want you to find your way to Lac La Croix, which you'll see in the upper left portion of this map. Well, what's your first question going to be? Well, where am I? You know, And if you're uh, where it says BWCA in the lower left, you're going to want to chart a more northerly uh, course to get to Lac La Croix. If you're where it says Coetico there in the middle, you're going to be charting a more uh, westerly uh, trajectory to get to where you're going. In a very similar fashion, 
in organizational life and in the process of planning, um, you know, here's where we'll do things that are part of situational analysis, like SWOT analysis and whatever else, just to understand what are the current circumstances, the environment in which we're operating, uh, what's going on with our organization, with our business, where, what is the starting point? And so that's a good way to think about uh, situational analysis is just beginning with the question of uh, where are we? And we'll get to SWOT. I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with the strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, threats analysis that's commonly a part of situational analysis. But I'm going to want to talk about some other uh, devices as well. But primarily as you do situational analysis, what we're going to want you to do is take a look at both uh, internal and external factors. So internal, what's going on within the business or organization, externally, what's happening in the wider world, in the general economy, in your industry uh, specifically, and we'll walk you through some approaches to uh, looking at both the internal and external factors. And here's one that's uh, commonly used, maybe not quite as common as SWAT, but it's a useful tool. Uh, it's an acronym, PESTER, that stands for the six factors that you see uh, listed there. And what you do is think about which of these factors are most significant for your uh, business, for your organization, what's the impact. And then as you move into the response column, here's where we, you begin uh, formulating strategies and goals to respond to whatever you see happening in this external uh, environment in which you're operating. Um, even though this uh, pester analysis, as it's called, has been used in exactly this form in many organizations, including many client organizations I've worked with, don't be hung up on that list of things. I've seen this done in many, many different forms. For example, I've seen a shorter version where you just use the first four items, so it would be called pest. You'd be looking at the political, economic, social, and technological realms. I've seen that uh, uh, reordered uh, where you put the legal one down where environmental is and then it becomes pestle um, and all sorts of uh, permutations and com com uh, combinations including you know adding additional factors that we might have on this list but it's just a systematic way of took, taking a look at the big picture what's the context in which uh, we're uh, operating how does that impact us and uh, what's our uh, uh, best play in terms of responding to whatever is going on in the broader uh, external environment. And of course, part of the external analysis is going to include some look at competition, whether direct or indirect, and then the questions about who uh, are your competitors and what represents uh, competition and to address uh, those middle bullet points, who and what, I take you back to the first point where we talk about direct and indirect uh, competition. So way back in the history of uh, broadcast television, it was usually pretty easy to define competition. All right? In the beginning of broadcast television, if you were ABC, you know exactly who your competitors were because there were CBS and NBC. Well, now as we move through the decades, uh, that followed, now all of a sudden there's a lot of different types of competitors because we began to see the emergence of cable uh, television and then more and more cable channels. I think on my current cable provider we've got over a thousand uh, cable channels. Uh, so it isn't as easy as saying it's NBC or ABC or CBS. Now we've got all these other cable channels. And then fast forward some more, you know, we've got Netflix and streaming and every other form of delivering uh, televised programs. So it isn't just a question of who are your competitors, but maybe what represents competition. I heard an interesting statistic just yesterday. It said there's more millennials today that subscribe to video gaming services than subscribe to any form of uh, broadcast uh, television, which is really interesting because that gets to the question of what represents competition. Now it isn't just other broadcasters like ABC or NBC. You know, it's social media, it's gaming, it's whatever else is commanding people's Eyeball. So we'd rather uh, have you think very broadly about competition in your world, uh, well beyond just the question of who are your uh, competitors, uh, but what represents uh, competition in the broadest sense. And then the last bullet that talks about competition in the nonprofit or public sector, uh, there's some that'll push back on this, but I'm going to say everybody has 
uh, competitors. If you're a government agency, a state agency, for example, you might be competing in the legislature against other state agencies for funding. If you're somebody like where I find myself at the moment at the University of Minnesota, you're competing with others at the legislature for funding. Maybe you're competing against other uh, large research uh, institutions. If you're a school district, you know, you might find yourself competing with that school district next door that just built the new uh, school building and the multi-million dollar athletic complex and so they're attracting students and the state aid dollars that go uh, with students and so I'm going to say uh, um, in pretty much every domain uh, we're going to find some form of competition. And that's the question of what you do with that and the most basic advice is this, you want to position yourself to avoid your competitor's strengths and to take advantage of uh, weaknesses. Uh, if any, on the part of your competitors. Uh, back to the strengths idea, I'll use Coke as an example because they're a dominant player in the uh, cola market, of course. And so if I'm gonna go into the beverage market, I'm probably not gonna wanna take on Coke with a cola product. Now, Coke has uh, their flavored waters, vitamin drinks, sports drinks, etc., but they don't have the same uh, dominant market share uh, that they do in the cola. Uh, niche. So if I'm going up against Coke, I'm probably going to want to avoid uh, their strength in the cola realm and go after some other uh, aspect of uh, Coke's business. And that's where we get to that second point, uh, taking advantage of any particular uh, weakness or soft spot that you might detect in uh, competition. And then I want to flip over to the internal side. Remember I said with uh, situational analysis, you want to take a look broadly at what's happening externally. And we've been through you know, a few ideas there. Uh, on the internal side of the ledger, you just want to take a look at what's going on within your own organization. What do you offer in terms of products or services? What do you have in terms of technological capability? Any other capabilities, manufacturing, distribution, management systems, human resources, financial resources, anything else that define you uh, as an organization and what you uh, bring to the competitive uh, market space. So we're going to urge uh, organizations to take a pretty comprehensive look at where uh, they are at in terms of uh, internal uh, capabilities. And the real idea vis-a-vis uh, -vis competition is how can you potentially leverage any of those internal factors to your advantage. And it's also worth thinking about if you have any uh, weaknesses, what you're going to do to make sure uh, none of those uh, put you in a position where you're at a significant competitive disadvantage. But most proactively, how do you leverage internal factors to your advantage? And I'll come back to this one uh, in a little bit, but while we're uh, on the subject here, I'm going to switch to SWOT because we've just talked about both internal and external analysis. SWOT is used because as simple as this uh, organizing scheme is, it's actually quite elegant and comprehensive. So we've got the classic strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats depicted here. The elegance is this. If you look at the top two items, strengths and weaknesses, those tend to be the internal things. And then the opportunities and threats tend to be the external factors. If you divide it left and right, on the left we've got the more good or positive things like strengths and opportunities. On the right we've got the negative things, weaknesses, uh, and threats. So it's a pretty elegant uh, structure. Now SWAT done well, in my opinion, uh, you would do this not just on your own organization, but looking at your key competitors. What are their strengths and what are their weaknesses? Are they looking at the same opportunities and threats uh, as uh, you are? So that's SWAT, and again, that's just one of many tools like Pester uh, that uh, are available to us to do uh, what I'm calling situational analysis. So however you do it, you just want to make sure you understand where you stand uh, even before you start looking uh, much farther down the path towards uh, your vision and what you're hoping to accomplish. So that's all about uh, what I'm calling situational analysis or answering the question, uh, where are we? Then we get to the second question, where do we want to be? This is all about strategy and goal uh, formulation. And this is kind of the fun part of strategic planning where executives can do some wishing, hoping, dreaming, scheming, blue skying, whatever. Ultimately, it's going to come down to the pragmatic. What do we have to do to get there? But just to talk about uh, strategy and goal formulation, one of the things I like to do with clients is start out 
uh, with kind of a blank uh, piece of paper and just say, you know, create the picture of what you'd like your organization to look like three years, five years, 10 years in the future. Uh, your time frame is gonna be dictated. It's different by business, by industry. Uh, but what you want is some futurity to your thinking, but you don't want to push your vision out there so far that you can't imagine how anything that you do today um, you know, could impact that chosen uh, future. And you can be bold, aggressive, uh, ambitious in your vision, maybe more incremental or status quo, um, but what you want to do is just be clear about where uh, you're headed. Uh, in the broadest uh, terms. And then that third bullet that talks about choice, I really want to emphasize that what you're doing is you create this vision um, and ultimately as you establish strategies and goals, you're choosing both what to do and maybe just as important what not to do. One of the downfalls sometimes in strategic planning is groups will get all excited about all the things they could potentially do and then resources get spread too thin. So strategic choice says let's be very clear about what we're choosing not to do and the things that we choose not to do will free up resources to focus on uh, those things that uh, we very specifically feel we can excel at, create competitive advantage at, and we're not gonna try to do all things or be all things to all people. And then that last bullet that talks about reality check just says whatever vision, goals, strategies you come up with have to be grounded in reality. Uh, the reality of where you're starting uh, your strategic journey. For example, if you're a one-person CPA practice, um, I would be surprised if you would say your vision in three years to be competing with the big accounting firms. Well, maybe that's way down the road for you, but your reality is you're starting you know, as a single uh, CPA, and so what's realistic for you? Um, even if you have a bold vision, what's uh, realistic for you to accomplish you know, in the next three, five, uh, 10 years? So um, that's where the situational analysis comes in. It just says, what's the reality of our current circumstances? And then any goals, strategies, et cetera, they come up with are gonna be uh, necessarily uh, bound by that reality. And another tool uh, for looking into the future is scenario planning. This is commonly used, maybe not used enough in uh, strategic planning, but just a quick overview of scenario planning. It basically has to do with um, looking at what are uh, identifiable trends that are impacting your business, your organization, your industries, and recognizing uh, key uncertainties. And if I talk about just a couple of things, Um, there's some clear demographic shifts that are taking place in our uh, world today. And, um, you know, if those are things that you know are clear trends, you can begin to formulate strategy around demographic shifts or what are other clear trends exist. Uh, important to recognize we don't know everything, but do uh, be clear about what you're uncertain about. Out of that, what you're going to want to do is come up with some manageable number of scenarios uh, to prepare for. Sometimes what locks people up and prevents people from doing planning is saying, well, we don't have perfect information, not everything is known, so we're going to wait and see what happens, and then we'll come up with strategies and goals. Uh, you might be behind your competition if that's uh, your stance. I'll just give you one quick example. Uh, way back before the Affordable Care Act passed, when that was being discussed in Congress and, you know, was possibly going to be passed, uh, I was working with the strategy team of one of the large uh, health care uh, insurance uh, organizations, and their strategy team was basically coming up with scenarios like this. Affordable Care Act, yes, or Affordable Care Act, no. Um, will it pass muster in the Supreme Court, yes or no? Um, if it does go forward, you know, what are the likely provisions? And even though everything couldn't be known until ultimately it did go through all those stages, you know, adopted uh, by Congress, uh, affirmed by the Supreme Court, and all the specific uh, provisions uh, articulated, um, the organization could at least be preparing for the most likely scenarios to come because one of the things they knew is that there would be a date where they'd actually have to go live uh, with insurance plans consistent with uh, whatever rolled out from the Affordable Care Act. So the beauty of scenario planning is it allows you to act even uh, when you don't have perfect information or, or perfect future knowledge. And that's reflected in this next uh, slide. So out of the scenarios that you conceive, 
The question is what strategies are likely to work in each scenario? Are there strategies that work potentially in multiple or maybe even all uh, scenarios? And the beauty of that second bullet point is uh, if there are strategies that work in multiple scenarios, those are the things we can begin implementing right now um, because there's a pretty good likelihood that's going to give us a leg up on uh, competition. And then the last bullet that talks about which strategies best leverage key success factors, I'm going to loop back to something we talked about earlier with, that had to do uh, with internal analysis. Here's where you can look at things like, are, those, are there success factors, as we're going to call them here, that you uh, have as a competitive advantage? For example, can you bring products to market quicker uh, than your competition? Do you uh, have some technological advantage? Uh, within your organization, M manufacturing excellence, quality, brand recognition. Coke certainly is one that would be able to bring uh, brand recognition to bear. Uh, interestingly, I read or uh, heard within the last couple of years, well, for many years, Coke, which I referred to earlier, the Coca Coca Cola Company, was for many years worldwide the most recognized brand that's now been superseded by Apple, as I understand it, within the last couple of years. So if you know you own uh, this particular success factor, whether it's brand recognition or anything else, you know, how are you going to leverage that into uh, any of the scenarios or just in general uh, in your strategies and goals uh, going forward? And then where you're going to want to go is get more and more specific about uh, what you're going to do. And so I want to walk through a little bit of a terminology uh, tutorial here. And I think we'll get general agreement on this use of terms. Uh, people will, however, use some of these terms that I'm going to introduce somewhat differently. But at least uh, I want to let you know how I'm thinking about these things. So as you move to establishing goals and objectives, the way I think about goals are very broad statements of what you want to accomplish. And then more specifically, objectives and measures, uh, you know, with uh, timetables attached that gets you very specifically down to what we're going to accomplish uh, in a measurable way uh, in terms of results uh, by when. So it's great to have broad goals, but really important to translate those into more and more specific kinds of uh, undertakings that uh, uh, you envision. And then to get uh, uh, even more specific, and I think I mentioned earlier, you might have seen in my introduction, I, I started my business that I call Summit Management back at a time where I'd done some climbing and mountaineering. So I'll just use this little tutorial using a mountain analogy. So let's say your goal uh, is to get to the top of Mount Everest. You see a little diagram on the mountain and standard climbing routes there uh, in the upper right. So that's your broad goal. And then you might have a number of objectives uh, supporting that goal. And when I talk about objectives, I'm talking about very specific measurable results that you intend to accomplish. And in my world, those are often what I would call a project. And so here's one objective associated with uh, climbing Everest would be to get your base camp and communications set up by the 1st of May, which is typically the start of the climbing season on uh, Everest. And of course, there'd be other objectives. But what we're doing is translating those broader goals into much more specific, tangible, concrete, uh, measurable results that we intend to accomplish. And that's where we're going to get into the disciplines of project management that we'll talk about uh, in just a little bit. And then you see the distinction between strategy and tactics. And this is going to be my definition. You won't necessarily find this in the dictionary or uh, textbook. But I think about strategy as a set of organizing principles for how you plan to reach your goal or goals. For example, in the world of climbing, there's two basic strategies. One is called alpine style. The other is expedition style. And just real quickly, expedition style you might be familiar with, uh, classic for going up Mount Everest, is you get the yaks and the Sherpas and all the gear and you march up to base camp and then you move up the mountain and set up successively higher camps, supply each of those camps, put in your fixed ropes. Once you have all that infrastructure in place, now you're actually going to send uh, climbing teams uh, to the top. Um, very different is Alpine style that says, hey, you get your backpack and ice sacks and I'll grab mine and we're just going to make a quick run to the top. So what happens is depending on what our strategy is, there's going to be different tactics that will help us execute on that strategy. For example, when you get down to tactics, if we decide that we're going to go Alpine style, you see some tactics are going to fit with that particular strategy. We're going to pair gear uh, to a minimum. We're going to emphasize speed, get to the summit and back down as quick as we can. 
If there's any question about should we take something or not, we're not taking it. Whereas if you're going expedition style, you say, yeah, if we could potentially use it, let's, uh, let's uh, take it along. So strategy is going to dictate uh, tactics. And then I'll use this example uh, to recognize that just like in mountain climbing and business or any other uh, form of organizational life, there's a lot of different ways to reach goals. So here I'm comparing Walmart with Target. And I'm going to say that each has uh, the same goal, increasing revenue and market share, and each has the same objective. This is kind of the uh, gold standard in the retail industry. Uh, both want to increase year over year same store sales. Well, now there's going to be different ways to accomplish uh, that goal and the objective of increasing same store sales. Walmart has what I'm gonna characterize as a value strategy. And then you see the tactics there where they emphasize everyday low price, store efficiency, low priced items. If you watch any of Walmart's advertising or walk into the store, you'll see these things. You know, they'll feature everyday low price and they'll have more uh, merchandise crammed into a space with narrower aisles, et cetera. Whereas you shift over to the target side of things, their strategy is what I'm gonna characterize as a value plus strategy. So yes, they also emphasize everyday low price. You probably recognize their tagline at Target, expect more, pay less. All right, so that's everyday low price. But they also have an emphasis on store aesthetic, aesthetics. A Target store is going to look different uh, than a Walmart store. And then you got the specialty items, you know, the, uh, the designer items and the specialty items that you can only get at Target that, incidentally, probably have higher margins. So it's just a different way of accomplishing the same goal uh, and objective. So there's many, many ways uh, to execute the same uh, uh, strategies, uh, you know, within a different organization. And now we get to a strategy execution specifically. So now we're on the third question, uh, which is how do we get there? This is the hard part. You see the quote there from John Bryson. I love that quote. John Bryson, by the way, is here at the University at the Humphrey Institute. He's written a book on strategic planning for the public sector. Uh, he'll be uh, quick to acknowledge that all the tools used in planning in the public sector are borrowed from tools that classically have, that have been used in private industry. But if you read the quote, we've all been there where, you know, at the first of the year we make some re resolution like we're going to get to the gym more, or lose weight, or eat better, or whatever else. And the question is, is that actually going to happen uh, or not? And for a lot of us, you know, we're well-intended, but then, you know, we don't necessarily follow through on the New Year's resolution. In very analogous fashion, you know, organizations classically, you know, are pretty good at coming up with vision and goals, et cetera, and then that kind of breaks down in that strategy execution stage. So what I'm gonna to wanna to talk about are some very uh, specific mechanisms that I've found useful in the realm of strategy uh, execution. So, the question of strategy execution basically comes down to these kind of questions. All right, who's going to need to do what and when to help us accomplish goals? Uh, the way that's going to happen is translate strategic goals, strategies, strategic objectives down into detailed operational and project plans, uh, put measurements in place, exercise uh, uh, ongoing discipline in monitoring progress towards accom uh, accomplishing goals and objectives. Um, periodically, you're going to back up uh, maybe to your situational analysis as things have changed. Uh, take a look at what's changed, maybe update, reassess, uh, or otherwise tweak uh, your strategies and goals. And again, this just gets back to the point that uh, planning is a very dynamic uh, process, not a one-time, once-a-year event where we create plans, but we're always uh, looking at how we're doing relative to what we set out to do, and in some cases, revising or updating the plans and goals uh, as we go. And then here's a simple depiction of the structure that I've evolved to using for strategy execution. And so I'll kind of talk you through this. Those of you, if you have a background in project management, you probably recognize the structure. I'm going to talk about portfolio program and project uh, management here. And what we're seeing is the use of the term portfolio and the practice of portfolio uh, management more and more aimed at execution of strategy and the accomplishment of uh, organization strategic uh, goals. Uh, we've used the term portfolio in a lot of different ways over time. Sometimes in the personal domain, when we use that term portfolio, we say, do you have a diversified uh, investment portfolio? Do you have stocks, bonds, real estate, whatever? 
in uh, business or organizational life, we'll often use the term portfolio to describe what portion of the business or organization is a particular executive responsible for. Now we're seeing the use of the term in the practice more and more uh, in this sense where we're using portfolio uh, program and project management specifically aimed at strategy execution. So I'm going to jump to the lowest level here um, of what I consider a hierarchy. So you see a bunch of projects at the lowest level in this hierarchy in the realm of project management. We've typically talked about programs as a collection of related uh, projects. And when we think about portfolios at an even higher level, we're thinking about what collection of programs and projects are aimed specifically at uh, accomplishing organizational goals and objectives. Now the beauty if you're a project manager working on one of those uh, one or more of those projects at the lowest level is if there is a clear link uh, to organizational strategy and goals presumably you know at a more senior executive level you've got a sponsor uh, an executive, you know, who can give you the resources and the priority that your project needs uh, to be uh, successful. If you're at the other end of the organizational hierarchy, if you're an executive wondering, you know, how do we implement strategy, if you can translate uh, pretty clearly down through this hierarchical structure down to very specific pro projects that are aimed at helping you accomplish organizational goals, the disciplines of project management are all centered around getting things done. So project managers are really good at breaking things down to who needs to do what uh, and when, um, responsibility assignments, uh, estimates, time estimates, uh, you know, cost and resource estimates, uh, tracking prog progress. And so what happens is, as we see uh, execution discipline at this more granular level, that is the project uh, level, as projects begin to succeed, we see more and more uh, movement towards uh, the accomplishment of organizational strategy uh, and goals. And then in the realm of what I might call portfolio management, in some organizations you're going to see uh, actually have teams of people that they're going to call portfolio managers. You know, one of the key disciplines of portfolio management is project selection. And I'm always coaching clients on as you evaluate projects, and of course it's possible to do lots of things, one of the things I would hope would be uh, a prime among your uh, selection criteria is what's the strategic value and fit for any project that you're uh, proposing? Executives are great at thinking of all kinds of things, but again, we can't do everything, so the question is if we're really going to choose what to do and what not to do, you know, what are the projects that best advance the strategic uh, agenda? And when I say projects, you might be calling these things strategic initiatives. I've got one client that calls these things priority projects. But are you evaluating critically, you know, what the value is to your strategic agenda for any project or projects that you might uh, undertake? And there's an old uh, Chinese proverb that says something like this, he who chases two rabbits catches neither. And I'm always coaching clients on, you know, uh, be careful about choosing too much. And one very practical exercise that I'll sometimes go through with the executive group says, you know, let's put all the projects that you're thinking about on an Excel spreadsheet. I'll put all mine on an Excel spreadsheet. We'll, uh, we'll consolidate those into one big master Excel spreadsheet. And it's amazing when you put them all together and put them in front of a group of executives, you know, the reaction is, whoa, that's a lot of stuff. Can we really do all that? Do we have the resources to support all that. Maybe we ought to pare back or delay uh, some of those things in the interest of making sure we accomplish those things you know, that do uh, uh, advance the uh, strategic agenda and goals. So sometimes uh, doing less, you actually get more accomplished. So that's just a quick tutorial on uh, what I'll call portfolio management uh, in support of uh, accomplishing strategic goals. And then just very generally, I use this diagram uh, to talk about alignment and uh, strategic direction. If you think about the large arrow as representing uh, strategic direction, here's where we want to move the organization, here's what we want to accomplish. If there is a lack of clarity about what are we trying to accomplish, um, 
If you look inside the organization, the little arrows that you see inside the big arrow are meant to represent functions or departments or teams or even individuals. What can happen uh, in an environment where there is a lack of strategic uh, direction or clarity about strategy is you can get people going off, people and teams going off in uh, tangents. In the example I use again, coming back to the boundary waters, if you and I are up in the boundary waters, I'm in the front of the canoe paddling like crazy and we don't seem to be getting anywhere and I look around and here's you in the back of the canoe paddling like crazy, but you're facing in the other direction. You know, it's pretty obvious why we aren't going anywhere. You know, if I said to you, hey, why don't you turn around, let's all Let's both paddle in the same direction. This is exactly what we're trying to do in organizational life with portfolio management, strategy translation, and whatever form, is if we can get everybody moving in the same direction with no more resources, without anybody working any harder, we can actually begin to move the canoe if we create uh, what I'm gonna call strategic alignment. And that's part of what uh, portfolio program and project management uh, helps organizations uh, to accomplish. And here's a quote from the futurist, Alvin Toffler. I don't know that he was thinking specifically about strategic planning, uh, but I like the quote saying, you gotta think about the big things where you're doing the small things so all the small things go in the right direction. That's exactly we're ta what we're talking about. You know, even going back to the first question that I asked you today and said, do you know your organization's mission and vision? Do you know your organization's strategic goals? Some portion of everybody's brain in an organization, I believe, needs to be occupied thinking some about these big picture sorts of things. So as you go about your day-to-day -day work and operations or the projects or anything else that you're working on, you know, is there alignment? Is there uh, a clear link uh, between and among everything that we're doing? So here's just a simple depiction of uh, strategic plans being translated into uh, different levels of detail. So strategic plans will get translated into uh, business unit plans, then into detailed operating and project plans. Ideally, hopefully, we'll see those translated right down to the level of the individual. So you'll know what your part is, I'll know what my part is. To the extent that we're able to do this, um, we're gonna do better at implementing our strategic agenda and accomplishing our strategic goals. But the other beauty is at the individual level, this is what brings real uh, meaning for people to the work that they're doing. You know, in organizational life these days, we talk a lot about employee engagement. And the question then is, well, how do we create uh, employee engagement? And the study I've done of that subject just basically says if we've got people working on things that they know are meaningful and important, and they're doing it together, working as a team to accomplish more than any one of us could individually, you know, those are key ingredients in, in creating employee engagement. So if you've got planning translated down into that individual level where under, everybody understands, you know, my job is important, your job is important, here's how all these pieces fit together, we've got engagement and again, uh, movement towards accomplishing our strategic goals and objectives. So here's a simple organization chart. So I just say if you're one of these four employees working for manager two in department B, you know, do you and I and everybody else, the other employees understand what our jobs are, how it links back up through this hierarchy to what our team is responsible for in term, uh, what our department or function is responsible for, and ultimately and ideally, uh, what's the tie to organizational uh, strategy and goals. So this is a simplistic org chart, um, but we're trying to describe the concept that I talk about linkage where everybody would understand that, you know, we're all a part of helping this organization uh, succeed at the strategic level. And then the last uh, major piece that I want to talk about, and uh, please weigh in with your questions, send those to Megan Fleming. Um, we will take some time at the end to answer uh, questions that you might have, but I want to talk about measurement. And so why do we talk about measurement? Well, that second bullet point says it all. What gets measured is what people tend to pay attention to. It's what uh, happens, as the first bullet point says, is what gives you a true gauge or picture on what's happening to the organization, how you're progressing or not towards accomplishing organizational goals. And the example I use is a personal one. So it happens my youngest daughter's birthday is today. She just turns 23 years old today. And then her older sister, I have two daughters, uh, two years old. I remember years ago when they were little girls, I took them to their annual uh, checkup with their pediatrician, 
who interviewed each girl in turn and asked this question, what do you have for breakfast? What do you have for lunch? What do you have for dinner? And what she was fishing for was there a sufficient number of fruits and vegetables in the mix. And then she gave us a really simple rule that I like. She says, just think five, five uh, daily servings of fruits and or vegetables. Don't worry about you know exactly what the mix is, but as long as it adds up to five, you're doing pretty good. And so I thought, well, that's a good idea. We can work with that. So I actually created a little chart that went up on our fridge at home and I had a column for each girl and for each day of the month and five little boxes that they were to check as they ate fruits and vegetables. And I said, okay, we're on the honor system. As you eat a fruit or vegetable, just walk over to the fridge and check the box. And I think they were being honest. And pretty soon I saw all the boxes, all five boxes for each uh, daughter for each day uh, filling up. And it was pretty clear to me that over the several months we did this, fruit and vegetable consumption in our household increased. Well, why did it increase? Well, uh, we were paying attention to it. We were measuring it. And after a few months of doing this, I thought to myself, yeah, well, obviously they've got it. Um, you know, they know it's important to eat fruits and vegetables. So I quit putting the chart up on the fridge. And then it was several months later, it dawned on me, you know what, I think fruits and vegetable consumption in our household is down. And why had it fallen off? Well, we're no longer measuring or paying attention to it. So again, what you measure matters. What you measure uh, is what happens. So we're thinking about strategic goals and objectives. Are you measuring the right things? Is it moving you inexorably towards uh, accomplishing those goals? Uh, here I want to talk just about, we don't have enough time, money, resources, energy to monitor, measure, count everything. So I'm going to urge uh, you to think about what are those vital few things that really let you know uh, how you're doing versus the trivial many. And the example or analogy I'll use in the realm of healthcare, you know, there's three basic things. If you go in for your annual physical, the things that they check pretty quickly, pulse, blood pressure, temperature. Right? There's a lot of other things that they could potentially measure, but right there with those three simple things, pulse, blood pressure, and temperature, we got a pretty good idea about how uh, you're doing. And so the question is, what are those vital few measures for your organization that drive uh, success? And you see a lot of different categories, financial, operational, quality, uh, et cetera. Um, you know, again, don't try to measure everything because there are some trivial things that really don't matter. For example, you know, in the realm of healthcare, you could think of all the things we could measure on the human body, you know, like how long is your nose or how many uh, hairs per square inch on your head. Well, that's a lot of uh, data, but is it useful information that helps us know how, uh, you know, what the human condition is? And in similar or analogous fashion, an organization, are we measuring those vital few things that really drive us towards organizational success, goal accomplishment, etc.? And then big picture, and I'm guessing many of you are familiar with this uh, because this has been around for a couple of decades now. Kaplan and Norton, two Harvard guys that came up with what's called balanced scorecard. And what Kaplan and Norton opened our eyes to, or a lot of us, was thinking beyond uh, just the f financial measures. You know, in, it's necessary, of course, to track financial measures. You know, revenues, profits, you know, expenses, whatever else. But what Kaplan Norton said, we also have to pay attention to how well we're serving customers, how they view us, to our internal business uh, processes. Are they efficient? Are they aligned in the realm of learning and growth? Are we creating the capacity to do more and better uh, in the future? And so what happens is, as organizations begin to pay attention to some of these other domains, uh, the financial stuff will tend to take care of itself. If you're doing a good job with your customers, if you have uh, internal uh, processes uh, that are efficient and aligned, and if you're creating the capacity to do more and better in the future, generally the financial stuff will take care of itself. And what you see in the middle, what Kaplan and Norton would call their strategy map, uh, it just is suggesting that Anything you come up with any, in any of these domains is driven by uh, strategy. And then we get more and more detailed. So I'm just going to blow up the financial bubble that you see up there on the top. Within any one of those domains or perspectives, as Kaplan and Norton term them, are going to be objectives, measures, targets, and initiatives. And so just to walk you through this, uh, within the financial domain, um, we might say we want to increase profitability. Well, what's our measure of that going to be? It's going to be earnings per share. What are we targeting? Well, a 10% increase in earnings per share. And then what specific initiatives are we going to undertake that's going to move us towards accomplishing 
uh, that objective. So you see a couple of likely initiatives. Again, I'm probably going to call these things projects. You might engage or undertake uh, some expense reduction projects, maybe um, some supply chain projects like vendor uh, selection and management, et cetera, each one of which, by the way, are going to have their own objectives, uh, timetables, responsibility assignments, uh, et cetera. So this is that management at that very granular project level that I talked about, all in support of uh, these higher level goals and objectives. And what you'd hope is that anyone working on these initiatives or projects, you know, understand how important it is to the organization's strategic agenda. Again, that gives meaning uh, to their work, but also helps uh, as an organization for us to ensure that uh, you know, we are driving at this granular level progress towards accomplishing our strategic uh, goals. And I love this quote. Um, when I originally found it, it was attributed to Albert Einstein. I've done a little more research, and I think I've got the proper attribution here. But I love the, the uh, play on words. It says, not everything that counts can be counted, and not everything that can be counted counts. So that first phrase, not everything that counts can be counted. Sometimes the things that really, really matter, you know, employee engagement, customer satisfaction, et cetera, those things that really matter, those can be harder to gauge or measure but important uh, to pay attention to those. And then the second phrase, not everything that can be counted counts. Sometimes we'll count things that are just easy to count. We can count dollars in and dollars out, but is it really telling us how uh, the organization is doing? Particularly, is it doing anything uh, to help us look more into the future, uh, not just into the past? And uh, so um, for me, that's a good way of thinking about uh, measurement generally is we want to get at those things that sometimes can be more difficult uh, to measure or count, but that matter uh, more. And then just to wrap up the discussion about measurement, uh, obviously we can count or measure lots of things. I'd urge you to focus on those vital few things that really help you to know, uh, are you moving towards accomplishing organizational goals or not? Remember that what gets measured is what tend to people tend to pay attention to. It's what uh, tends to happen. Measurement drives improvement and accomplishment of organizational goals. And if you create a scorecard that reflects accurately what you're really trying to accomplish as an organization uh, at the highest level, and then on down through all those uh, detailed uh, levels of performance. And if you've got the right measures in place, generally it's gonna drive success or increase the odds of success. And then I'll circle back to an idea I've alluded to a couple of times along the way, and that is um, everyone has a role in uh, creating success uh, for uh, the organization. Um, and I'm looking back at some of your uh, chats, uh, some of you who are participating are involved in creating strategy, others involved in leading projects, others involved in various departments, so presumably in a role with strategy execution. So whether you find yourself at a senior leadership level where you're creating strategy or at the middle levels of management or first line supervision or employee, we'd hope that everyone would understand that each and every one of us in an organization has a role to play in helping the organization to succeed. Everyone is linked together. And in my view, third bullet says if even one uh, fails to that extent, we've all failed or fallen short of whatever goals uh, we're setting out to accomplish. We need everyone to succeed for the organization to succeed. And so especially if you're a manager or a leader uh, at any level in the organization, you have a stake in the success of your employees. If you're an employee, you have a stake in the success of your uh, organization. And for me, there's kind of uh, two sides to this, and that is if we're all taking this attitude that each and every one of us has a role, um, that will, of course, uh, move the organization toward accomplishing its uh, uh, goals and objectives, but it also has uh, career value for any of us that think and act uh, strategically. You know, if you don't know what, our, what is our organization's mission, what are the current strategic goals, how do those translate into our function, our department, our team, and then, by the way, what's my role? I urge uh, any participant in any of the strategic planning classes that I take, whatever level you are, if you don't know, um, 
it's important to ask. Ask your manager. If your manager doesn't know, then he or she has to you know, go up and ask uh, uh, their uh, leader. Um, especially as organizations grow in size, it's harder and harder to translate uh, from the top down. So a lot of times success and communication and clarity is driven from the bottom up just by each of us asking, what's my role? How does my job link to or support uh, organizational goals? And if you can do that as an individual wherever you are in the organization, I'm going to say that's uh, career enhancing for you and is certainly adding value uh, to your organizations. So with that, if you have questions, this would be the time. We got uh, five minutes or so left. I appreciate you listening. Um, but just go ahead and uh, offer up any questions that you might be uh, interested in. So I will read them off if that works yeah. for you. Yeah. Okay. So what can you do when you are to implement competing or even opposing strategies slash goals? Well, that's not an uncommon circumstance to find yourself in. And here's where I'd leverage on that last point that I was making. If you don't know, uh, ask. Go to your manager or beyond. Because if you're put in a position, which is kind of a no-win situation, where you're asked to implement competing goals or objectives, um, and, and that's an impossibility, you know, I think it's important to, you know, ask, well, which of these are a higher priority? If we can't do both, which one is more important to do? Maybe we do them sequentially. But sometimes just asking uh, dumb questions, you know, is it possible to do both? How can I be expected to do both? You know, can you give me some guidance or direction on this? Um, a lot of times I'll tell people, use me, you know, uh, you know, to blame and just say, hey, I've attended this webinar or this seminar or whatever. And, you know, the seminar leader said, you know, go back and ask your manager. So if you're put in that position of having to implement uh, what might be seen as uh, opposing or contradicting strategies and goals, just ask, you know, is this really what we're trying to accomplish? Can we accomplish both of these things? Can you give me uh, better guidance on this? And then do you know if there are consulting resources within the university for departmental strategic planning? Um, I personally don't know because I'm an outside consultant. My role here at the university is I'm hired as an independent consultant to teach classes like strategic planning. Um, and even though I'm a graduate of the university, I got my MBA here, I can't comment knowledgeably. So I'd have to defer on that question. My guess is there are resources, but I personally am not familiar. I'm sorry. And what if you don't have a long-term plan? They say if you don't exactly have a vision for five to 10 years down the road with a certain project, how do you still strategize? Well, if there isn't a clear vision five to 10 years down the road, how do you strategize? strategize? One of the things I'd always think about in the day-to-day -day work that you're doing, the projects you're working on, the operations that you're part of, is can you at least discern what your current priorities are? You know, if you can look at just the steps that are immediately in front of you, all right, maybe you don't know five years, 10 years out, but sorting through, you know, everything that's on your plate, you know, what are uh, the the highest priorities, the most mission advancing things uh, that you can devote your energies and resources to. And that way we can kind of create our own mini strategy, if you will, in the absence of uh, more clarity about what are uh, the longer term vision and goals. I realize that that's not an uncommon situation to find uh, yourselves in. So again, you know, I would certainly run that up the organizational hierarchy and ask questions, but even in, in the day to day within this, the realm of things that you have uh, purview over, you know, uh, you decide, <laughs> you know, what the key priorities are and what you're going to devote your energies and your team energies and resources to. And if you can at least pursue, uh, to the best of your knowledge, what the highest priority, highest value type things are, um, you got a better shot at adding strategic value. But ideally, you'd be able to ask and get an answer to that. You know, where are we headed three, five, ten years down the road? And how do I best align what I'm doing right now uh, to that longer term vision? Good question. And then um, one of the um, participants is asking if you could please repeat the key points on how we can create employee engagement. Yeah, when I've, when I've studied the uh, question of employee engagement, um, kind of what I've come up with says employees feel engaged when they're part of an organization where they know the work they're doing is meaningful 
and they're doing it together uh, as a team. So together as a team, we're able to accomplish more than any one of us could uh, individually. And then the third thing that I've also heard a lot about, many of you have probably uh, taken or read about Strengths Finder. If added to all that, I'm working on things that really do allow me to leverage my individual strengths. You put those ingredients together, meaningful work, people doing it together as a team, and individually, you know, working on things that to best leverage my personal strengths. Those things right there uh, are pretty tangible things that uh, all help to create engagement. Thanks for that good question. Great, and then we'll do one more question and then for any participants who haven't received an answer, we will uh, personally chat you back uh, the answer since we have Dick uh, right here to help us. So the last question is, uh, you spoke to employee engagement, but when strategy is coming from the top and filtering down, how do you ensure that the strategy or the plan creates buy-in from those frontline employees? Yeah. Well, quick answer to that, I said if people find themselves working on meaningful work, doing things that they believe are important, to the extent that we can, as managers, translate vision, strategy, goals in a way that speaks to that question. Are you asking me to do something that's important, that's valuable, that's going to make a difference in the world? If, if we can coach people up on the idea that, yes, your job matters, uh, your performance matters, you are doing uh, work that's important, and here's why, you know, we can help people understand that, yes, indeed, they are doing uh, meaningful, important work because people don't sometimes don't see that in their day-to-day -day work. They just say, well, I come in and do a bunch of stuff, and then I go home, and I come in the next day and do a bunch of other stuff. As managers, if we can help translate strategy in a way that says this is important to the organization or organization has a really important mission, you know, that's going to make the world a better place, um, to the extent that you can help me as an individual employee feel like I'm doing that sort of meaningful work and connect it directly to uh, tangible goals that the organization has, I'm going to come away feeling better about the work that I'm doing. Great. Well, Dick, thank you so much for all of your time and your useful information. Like I said, I am going to um, look through these chats and the Q&As. So if you do have another question, feel free to ask and we'll get back to you via this chat. So just make sure you still stay logged on. And as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending a link to the webinar recording in a couple of days. And then up on this slide here, here are some relevant courses if you would like to learn more. Uh, I was talking with Dick before this started and it looks like he's teaching these first two. So the management essentials for success and strategic planning and measurement. And you can contact me directly. My contact information is at the bottom of this slide and I can help get you registered for these courses. And you can also visit our website, so ccaps.umn.edu, and you um, can see the fullest of classes and educational programs. Thank you so much for joining us today, and have a wonderful rest of your afternoon.